Secretly recorded from deep inside the bowels of a decommissioned missile silo, we bring you the man, one single man, who wants to bring light to the darkness and dark to the lightness. Although he's not always right, he is always certain. So now, with security protocols in place, the protesters have been forced back behind the barricades and the blast doors are now sealed. Without further delay, let me introduce you to the host of Hutcast, Mr. Tim Hutner. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. You can now take your post. The views and opinions expressed in this program are solely those of the individual and participants. These views and opinions expressed do not represent those of the host or the show. The opinions in this broadcast are not to replace your legal, medical, or spiritual professionals. Happy Sunday, 7-9-2023. I hope you all had a fantastic 4th of July. Hutcast is off the air celebrating his independence from the rulers of Britain some 200 years later. Today, we have a special guest, a guest about medical system. The medical system as we know it is, is kind of broken. We all knew that for a while, but this one's kind of a different case, a very special case. Scott Shera is on the show to describe his events, his total tragic story about the loss of his daughter. He's here via phone, and we're going to ask him some questions and maybe help spread his message. Again, Hutcast, we'll be right back in... Two seconds. Stand by. The current healthcare system is not meeting the needs of real people. People are demanding better, better care, better options, and want results. So Gareth Care has launched and is advocating for those in the U.S. and internationally, as people are realizing the controlled system has not been there for them. If you want your own independent advocate, that is not controlled by big corporations, call or text and enroll today to get your advocate for your needs serving all ages. For any healthcare need you might have, you matter. Here's how you get started. www.garethcare.com G-R-A-I-T-H-C-A-R-E.com Call Gareth Care Direct 1-469-864-7149 Call or text a question to Healthcare Sucks and get an advocate with Gareth Care, 1-469-864-7149. Mention Hutcast and you'll get a 10% discount on your advocacy bundle. And the staff at Gareth Care will take care of you. Remember to mention Hutcast, get that extra 10% off your first bundle of time. And this is all brought to you from Gareth Care. Welcome to Hutcast. Welcome back to Hutcast. We have an very extraordinary guest today, Scott Shera, is going to share a story about his daughter and how things kind of went very bad very fast. Uh, are you there, Scott? I am. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Thanks for coming on the show. And, and, and again, I'm glad to, to, to know you, but I'm very sorry for the consequences of what happened. What, let's start out with, who's Gracie? Do we call her Gracie or do we call her Grace? We call her Grace. Yeah, she... She had a little stinker in her kindergarten class before we homeschooled, whose name was Gracie. So she always made sure that we we told uh, everybody that she's Grace, not Gracie. <laughs> okay. She was she was a, a stickler for those type of things. So she like I'll give you another quick example. She I would say, "Come on, guys, let's get going," and she would say, "Dad, we're not guys." No. <laughs> So you got corrected. Yes. Uh, and when she did it, uh, you know, she didn't do it like, like our wives do it. She did it lovingly. <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's awesome. Now, now let's start out with the story of Gracie. When, when how do you, how did you know that she was that special when, when you first brought her to home? Well, I'll take a step back because I think, uh, the the um so this isn't going to be a biology lesson although i'm going to tell you how grace was conceived if we go all the way back she was born september 22nd of 2002 we go nine months earlier my wife and i are both 39 years old at that point uh, we had 
the perfect family, boy, girl, you know, we're chasing the American dream. And we asked God to lead in the baby department uh, because we weren't letting him lead. And I, I tease Cindy's my wife's name. I tease her that she's fertile Myrtle and fertile Myrtle became pregnant five months later. Yeah. So I think that's why, you know, we, we had turned it over to, to the Lord to lead. And I mean, unbelievably how he blessed us with her. So I, I'd look at why was grace special? You know, of course, that's one reason we homeschooled her. That's another reason. And we never vaccinated her. But when she came out, what's interesting is I was in the delivery room and I thought, I think she has Down syndrome. We had never never done any of the testing. The doctors then had a huddle and they came in a bit later and said, we suspect your daughter has Down syndrome. Do you want to keep her? Whoa. Which they weren't talking about abortion at that point. I mean, in the United States, 67% of Down's children are aborted before birth. But they were just assuming that we wouldn't want her, that we'd want to put her up for adoption. And, you know, of course we wanted her. So you asked, how did we know she was special? Well, we started doing um, some training for for her speaking ability. And that's the first time I really knew she was special. We had some therapists come in the house and she would understand things. You know, I, you know you're processing, we've never had a Down syndrome. Uh, person in our life so you're thinking well this is not going to work out real well but you know we're we're along for the ride and we're going to make the best of it well all of a sudden she would start paying attention to these two therapists and then i could tell her things even though she couldn't communicate i could tell her things and she would do it you know, like stiffen her legs and then she started signing so my wife taught her through a baby science class, how to sign. So she would sign more milk if she wanted more mama's milk. And then we got introduced to what's called hippotherapy, which is horse riding to get the the muscle stimulated uh, for, for her voice. And she started talking. And uh, from there, you know, the first thing that, that I would say where I noticed she was special is she was about six years old. And my wife and I, got into an argument and she said, aren't you supposed to apologize? <laughs> and I said, you know, think about a six year old with Down syndrome. We never taught her any of this stuff. And I said, yeah, you're right, Grace. And so I apologized, Cindy apologized. And then, but that wasn't enough for Grace. And this is where the special piece come in, comes in. She said, aren't you supposed to kiss? <laughs> I thought, oh, my gosh, that is unbelievably brilliant. And I said, yeah, you're right. So, of course, one of us was ready and one wasn't. But then I'll add one more thing to that, and then you can go on with another question, is that uh, probably when she was, so that was about six, I would say when she was nine or ten range, she started calling me Earthly Dad. Earthly Dad? Earthly Dad, yeah. Okay. And she called my wife Earthly Mom. Well, who does that? You know, she, but she understood. She understood where she fits. She understood God's plan, and she, um, she, she uh, executed it the way we're supposed to. That you know, we we just don't have that inside of us. You know, we're judgmental. As soon as we become you know outside of seven, eight, nine years old, we learn to to be very judgmental, and you know that's not God's way. But grace, grace is not like that at all. Wow. That's an, that's an incredible story. Wow, I, I'm still in awe there. Um, what were some of the challenges faced as she was growing up? I mean, I, as a baby with Downs is, is always a challenge, but I mean, beyond that, how, what were the challenges that, she had, that you had with her? Well, that's a great question. You know, I would say the answer to that question is none, but it, the reason I say that is because God blinded us to the challenges. We had uh, one of the few medical professionals that understood we wanted to keep Grace said to us, you know, there, you can put two different kids or, you know, the same kid in two different households and they can turn out differently. And your view of Grace should be the sky is the limit. And uh -huh. we, we had that view. She did, just to give you some perspective, she could read and write. She uh, played violin and she played it well. She played for my daughter's wedding. I did read uh, she did play violin, yes. 
Yeah, she, of course, rode horse, as I referenced earlier. She deer hunted with me, oh. and she was, she was super accurate. Wow. She was, she shot a 243, because, you know, that doesn't kick very much, but, I mean, unbelievable accuracy, because she didn't, she never learned how to flinch. I taught her how to shoot, and she just did it. And she would, she would show me how, you know, when we go to the target and see how well she did, she'd show me how much better she always did than me. Ah, there uh, you go. And I, I taught her how to drive a car. She never got a driver's license, um, but and it's simply because she died too soon. She would have got her driver's license. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, how she connected the dots. I'll give you a quick story. So when she turned 18, she wanted to vote. And because she didn't have a driver's license, we had to get an ID. So then I thought, well, why don't we stop at the uh, where we bank? I'll set up an appointment with the branch manager. Let's get a checking account open up. So we same day we got her, her ID. We go to the uh, credit union branch and the branch manager sets up the checking account and then she says to grace would you also like a credit card <laughs> and, and grace, grace says well of course yeah <laughs> and she says what would you like the limit to be and grace says 30 and the branch manager said 30 dollars and grace said no 30 thousand <laughs> There you have that, right? Yeah. So you asked, you know, what were the limitations? I, you know, I'll, I'll share with you at Grace's funeral. I was very weak. I had just gotten out of the hospital. I went into the hospital three days after Grace died. I just about died. And, but I gave a eulogy. And when uh, it was my turn to speak, I, I said, you know, in the line, people are coming up to Cindy and I and saying how great of a job we did with Grace. And the reality is we didn't do a great job at all. And the reason is is because we didn't have to do anything. Our life was just blessed with her. She was she was a gift. She didn't have any of the the snotty teenage years, those things that you end up going through as parents. So, I mean, she was, uh, I said, you don't get any credit in God's economy for taking care of somebody <laughs> like Grace. You get credit when you can love the unlovable, and that's what Grace showed. And I, then I said, you know, I, I don't even know that I love the un, unlovable in my sleep. Mm. And you know, so I, I would. You know, of course, you have you have problems, but I, you know, when you uh, ask me for specific problems we had, I would say, well, the only only thing I would say was re really interesting is she went through a point when where she was an escape artist where she just wanted to do everything and didn't care who was paying attention. And so we ended up putting a barn door hook on our screen door really high up so she couldn't reach it. <laughs> uh, so she went through that phase for about, oh, I would say, three years. You know, when we go to a wedding, whatever, one of us just had to be designated to watching Grace because right. she went, she just wanted to escape. But other than that's the only thing I can really remember that was negative. Okay. With her exceptional talents... Only her father and her family would know something that the rest of the world wouldn't know. What would that be? Did she like something, and well, did she did she she wanted to drive? What what is that very? <laughs> well, that's an easy one for me because I think I always thought Grace and I would do stand up comedy together. Uh huh. Yeah, and I she was naturally funny, just absolutely funny, and I thought I could be her sidekick. I thought she might be the first Down syndrome comic and with a dad as a sidekick. So. <laughs> um, and she got stuff. So she liked cats, for example, but uh -huh. she got that cats would divide a room. So I told Grace, I said, dad's allergic to cats. And well, how do you know? I said, well, because every time a cat walks in front of me, my right leg goes up uncontrollably. And, you know, she got that. It wasn't that, you know, she, she didn't look down at me for that. She just saw the humor in that, that, you know, cats are something that, that you can really, do comedy about and you know and i'll share an example when we were deer hunting you know, and you know when you deer hunt there's a lot of boring time and we're sitting there one time in the stand and she said dad i have a joke for you i said what's your joke and she said where do bees go to the bathroom i said i don't know where do they go to the bathroom and she says the bp station which for those of you who don't know what BP stations are, that's a gas station chain that's in the Midwest. So, I mean, the BP <laughs> station, oh my gosh, I'm, I thought, this BPs. is so funny. And she just makes it up on her own. British Petroleum, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
to the BP yeah, so station. Yeah, I would say her humor was, uh, you know, she got. Well, I mean, when she learned the joke, um, uh, have you read the book under the under the bleachers? And so she would tell it, ask people, and I'd say, no, I haven't heard that. And and uh, she's she, so she'd say, have you read the book under the bleachers? No. And, and she'd say, well, do you want to know who it was written by? And they said, well, yeah, who was it written by? And she'd say, see more butts. Yeah. And so that she she would make up her own jokes based on that base joke that she was told. And the old oh, Snoopy gosh. sales thing, right? Right. Oh, it was. It was just was so. I, I, of course, I miss her hugs mostly, but you know, her sense of humor was it was a blast. I just I enjoyed it. Well, it sounds like she was very successful. And given that, people around the world may be listening to this. What would you say, what would you tell them her secret to her success was? Um, She never got distracted. You know, our life is full of distractions. And uh, her favorite scripture verse was 1 John 4, 8, which she abbreviated, God is love. And she just never got distracted. She just always realized that. Okay, God's got this. Uh, my son committed suicide in in 2018. Mm, the day sorry. after the day after he committed suicide, Grace and I were riding in my truck together, and I said, "Grace, you know God's got this, right?" And she said, "I know, Dad." Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is I didn't know. You know, I was trying to comfort her, but she ended up comforting me. But she really did know. She, you know, we get distracted, and then you know, then it it leads to all kinds of things that aren't helpful sure. to to our thought process, etc. She never got distracted. Well, that that's uh, that's incredible. Yeah, you know, at the beginning, I I thought, you know, she's not going to experience a lot of things in life because she has Down syndrome. Uh huh. And then as I I learned what Down syndrome is about, and then we were, we got to the point where we explained to her she has Down syndrome. So she understood that, and she embraced it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I wish I had Down syndrome. Which leads me into my next question. Given her circumstances, you have parents with similar kids out there, similar children. What would you tell them parents? I would tell them uh, that learn from your your Down syndrome child because they they are an angel with you on earth and they're there to to teach you. Um, Grace, you know, as I've shared already, Grace did a lot of teaching for us. She's uh, interestingly, God took her home early, I think, to wake me up to teach me a lot more, and that's you know that's what's happening today. But I would say anybody who has a down syndrome child or any disabled child uh, watch what they teach you and pay attention to it because you've got an angel okay very good very good answer we are 15 minutes and 20 15, 16 minutes into the second first segment i want to move on to the uh, next segment which is going to be about the hospital stay now I, again i want you to know that we don't want to light things on fire but we want to make sure that your story is very told and very direct so can you stay with me for a second? You bet. Okay. Podcast, we'll be right back. In today's busy world, staying healthy and alert have become essential for those of us who want to get the most out of ourselves. So before you reach for that energy drink, ask yourself, are you really giving your body the best? If you want the energy without the jitters that commonly come from today's most popular energy drinks, then reach for something better. Reach for Super Fuel. Super Fuel is made by Casmo Incorporated. Super Fuel is a healthy boost. Super Fuel is made with vitamins B6, B12, and taurine, that is an amino acid that aids in weight loss and protects heart tissue, beetroot powder, and other healthy ingredients that will give you a quick, healthy boost. Make Super Fuel a great tasting, low calorie addition to your daily regimen. Super Fuel by Casmo Incorporated. It can be ordered by visiting our website at 
superfuel.me or calling 833-383-5912. That's right, Superfuel by Casmo Incorporated at www.superfuelme or calling 833-383-5912. Superfuel. Welcome back, Outcast. Had to take a break there for our sponsors. And today we're going to have this conversation, but now we're going to shift gears. We're going to pump these brakes and say, okay, what happened that brought Grace to this hospital? Scott, fill us in on that, would you? Uh, sure. We, we'll go to September of 2021, and Grace had a cold. We ended up testing her on October 1st for COVID. And the reason we did is because we were going to go to a wedding that day. My wife's, um, one of my wife's cousins was getting married. We wanted to go to a wedding and we just thought, well, we better not bring Grace if she has COVID. So she got a home test. Uh, we tested her. She tested positive. So we stayed home. Grace was on the full FLCCC protocol. And what is the FLCC? So that's the front lines, critical COVID care. So this was Dr. Pierre Corey, Dr. Paul Merrick. They, they put this organization together to help people with alternative treatments for COVID. Mm. So that included ivermectin, vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin A, you know, the, the entire protocol, zinc. And so we started Grace on everything. Uh, the one thing that we also did was we bought the recommended pulse ox, which is a meter that you put on your finger to measure oxygen saturation. Like an oximeter? Yes. Okay. I just yeah, you know, I'm I'm using the the short version name. Okay. Anyway, we we started measuring that, which you know, at this point, now that I see everything, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and now that I see things um, as as they are versus what I thought was going on, I wish we would have never bought the pulse ox. And the reason is is because not because that's a bad thing to own, it's because we were trusting what they said in the protocol versus we didn't have a baseline. So what happens with people's oxygen is when you get sick with a cold or flu, whatever, your oxygen saturation goes down. So if we would have had a baseline for grace, when we started measuring now with COVID, we would have known, okay, it's fine. We'll just, we'll just walk through this. It's no big deal. But when that number went to 88%, the protocol said, if it goes below 94%, uh, admit yourself to the hospital. So that set a sequence of events where, unfortunately, we let fear overtake us. And uh, you know, the spirit of fear is not given to us by God. And that is by far and away the biggest take-home message I could tell anybody is if you have that fear, go opposite. Because that fear is why Grace is not here today. Mm. Ultimately, we went to the emergency room and admitted Grace to the hospital. The emergency room physician said, we'll just put her on oxygen and a steroid for three or four days and she'll be home. And I believed that. I didn't understand that there was a nefarious agenda going on at that point. So I thought, well, that makes sense to me. So we did that. And if they would have only treated Grace with a steroid and oxygen, Grace would be here today. And I know that with 100% uh, certainty because I went into a different hospital three days after Grace died, and they used a protocol that saved my life. I was turned around in 24 hours, and I was near dead. I thought October 16th was going to be my last day on Earth. Grace's last day was October 13th, the week after we admitted her to the hospital. So... Just a short version of that story is I stayed with Grace from October 6th in the emergency room until October 10th. I was taken out by an armed guard the morning of the 10th. We had to hire an attorney to get my daughter Jessica in as a replacement advocate. And so the attorney negotiated with the hospital attorney to get Jessica in. My wife could not do it at the time because she had COVID. We had 47 hours total without advocacy. When we reviewed the records after Grace died, we saw that the doctor ordered a sedation med called Presidex, and they started her on a low dose on October 9th. 
Presidex, if you look up the package in for cert for that drug, says you're not supposed to use it for more than 24 hours. They started around the low dose then. While we didn't have advocacy, they increased the dose six different times. So they sedated my little buddy instead of taking care of her. When Jessica got to the room, surprisingly, Grace was still herself. Uh, interestingly, one of the key things that Grace said to Jessica is the nurses are idiots. So that is way out of context for Grace uh, based on you know everything about her. But she could see things. That so, we can, yes. Yeah, so they didn't treat her right. Uh, and, of course, she saw how, you know me being taken out by an armed guard, that whole thing. I mean, so she... Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was not a good that was not a good situation. But ultimately, so now the evening of October twelfth, Grace is already being sedated for four days, and yet still herself, she sits up in bed before she went to sleep that night. Jessica called her two boys, Grace's nephews, on a FaceTime call, and Grace sat up with a BiPAP mask on and hollered and waved to them and said, Hi boys. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was intelligible. The next morning the doctor called so now we're I'm going to walk through quickly Grace's last day on earth, which was October 13th of 2021. The doctor called Cindy and I about 10 o'clock in the morning. He was following up on a call from the night before. And the purpose of the call from the night before was to ask us for a pre-authorization to put Grace on a ventilator just in case. So we had already done the research on a ventilator. We knew that a ventilator has a 90% kill rate with COVID. We're not doing a ventilator. Grace was never a ventilator candidate. But as I have become a full-time advocate and researcher, I found out the motive behind a ventilator. It's about a $300,000 payday to the hospital. Mm. So he calls us to ask about this ventilator again for the fifth time. We say no for the fifth time. He immediately switches gears and said, Grace had such a good day yesterday, we should work on nutrition. And we need to get her out of bed so she can get out of here in the next several days. Okay. So we we buy into all of that. We approve a feeding tube. And when you now you overlay the phone records with the hospital records, you see what was going on. Um, wait till you hear what happened next. So while we're on the phone with him, they increased the dose of Presidex to 14 times the dose. They started her on four and a half days earlier. The maximum allowable dose simultaneous with hanging up the phone with us, the doctor put an illegal do not resuscitate order on Grace. Then as the day progressed, they added to precedence lorazepam and morphine. So the first cause of death on Grace's death certificate is acute respiratory failure with hypoxemia. That's a direct cause and effect for using Presidex for more than 24 hours. It says it right in the package insert that this will happen. It doesn't say it may happen. It will happen, and it did happen. Well, then the second cause of death they listed on the death certificate was COVID-19 pneumonia. Grace did not have COVID by any measurement on the day of her death. Okay. The second cause of death was combining Presidex with lorazepam and morphine. That's what you give hospice patients in the last half hour of their life. They combined those drugs in a 29-minute window that you and I could not have survived, Tim. Wow. And we have multiple experts that that's, have said to us, the meds killed your daughter. So we know this. In fact, as I detailed out how that happened and cross everything cross-referenced with the records, I realized after I got through everything about five months after Grace died, I realized she was actually murdered. And the, the combination of meds then... Grace started, so Jessica's in the room with her. They gave her morphine at 6.15. Remember, the phone call with the doctor is about 10 o'clock. At 10.56, they put the DNR order on Grace. They gave started giving her lorazepam. Then at 5.46, a dose of lorazepam. 5.49, a dose of lorazepam. 6.15, a dose of morphine. And that's that 29-minute window. About 6.30, Jessica feels Grace starting to get cold. She asked for the... ICU nurse who has 14 years of experience. She's the one who gave Grace the meds. She asked her, can you come in and take a temp? You know, Grace is getting cold and she would refuse to come in the room. In fact, no doctor or nurse came in the room after they gave Grace morphine. 
The morphine package insert specifically says to monitor the patient and keep the reversal drug bedside because you're not supposed to combine those meds. They're contraindicated. They can cause death. It says it right in the black box warning on the morphine package insert. No doctor or nurse came in the room after they gave Grace morphine. The nurse told Jessica, that's normal. Just cover her with a blanket. She kept getting colder. At 7.20, Jessica called Cindy and I. You know, we're, we have no idea what's going on. She called us panicking on a FaceTime call and said, Dad, Gracie's numbers are dropping like crazy. I said, get the nurses in. She said, I've been trying. They refuse. So Cindy and I start screaming through the phone, through the FaceTime call, save our daughter. And they holler back from outside the room, she's DNR. Do not resuscitate. This is the first time it's like, we're clueless on this. Oh boy. So we scream back, she's not DNR. Save our daughter. They would not come in the room. They refused. And we watched Grace die seven minutes later at 727 on a uh-huh. FaceTime call. And oh, we got a couple of clues into this as we talked with Jessica because later, you know, after everything shook out that evening, I, I took Cindy to the hospital immediately. I went in the truck because I had COVID. Well, when we talked with Jessica afterwards, she said, Dad, there was an armed guard posted outside the room. Oh, boy. She had She estimated 30 nurses outside Grace's room because of shift change and this armed guard. And then the armed guard watched Jessica. She she crawled in bed with Grace after she died waiting for Cindy. And the armed guard stood outside the nurse's window and watched Jessica the entire time. We found out from a medical malpractice nurse who reviewed the records that during that window, because Grace was still on the BiPAP, she likely could have been resuscitated. Then... The last thing I'll say, Tim, before you can start asking some more questions is as that evening, you know, the, the coroner came and, you know, the body bag, that whole thing, mm-hmm. um, the, our pastor walked Cindy out in a wheelchair and a nurse had Grace's belongings on a cart and she leaned down next to Cindy as they were walking out and said, Mrs. Shara, me and several of the nurses don't think Grace should have died today. Mm-hmm. And from there, you know, now we're, now we're, our whole family is full-time advocates and yep. researchers. And because we, we knew something bad happened, but at the beginning we thought it was, was simply an anomaly. And so we wanted the hospital to know what's going on. So we assembled all the records. I requested a meeting with the doctor and the hospital CEO. They refused to meet and you think, what is going on? Why wouldn't they want to know? We thought, you know, again, we thought it was an anomaly. So we wanted to show them what we found out. So history doesn't repeat itself. Well, as I have found out now, uh, that they want history to repeat itself. That was the goal. Okay. Wow. I'm still processing that. It's, it's intense. Every time I tell the story, it's... Uh, I can hear it in your voice. It's it's tough to it's tough to relive it. The hardest the hardest part of reliving it is October tenth when I was taken out by the Iron Guard. Uh, for about three months after Grace died, I woke up every single night in the middle of the night, two three in the morning, uh, and with the question on my mind, why didn't I take her with me? We had never left Grace alone ever. Why didn't I take her with me? But I can't, uh, you know, you, I can't second guess that now. I, I know God is sovereign. He knew that this would light a fire under my lazy rear end. And now I'm doing this 70 plus hours a week. Well, that's why we're here today, to tell that story. I've had a couple of people on the show that had similar issues, not like this, but the same COVID stuff. And they all have this common thing in and it just, you, you sit back and you go, this don't even make any sense. Annie Quiner, Scott, Annie Quiner story. Uh, oh, there's the list is, it goes on. But here, here's what I want to do now. In the last segment, because we are like 15 minutes, almost 15 minutes into this section, I want to talk about, not to turn this into a conspiracy, but the legal ramifications of what just happened with this last segment. And I I believe that this is where the rubber hits the road. So I'll give you a moment to compose. 
let's uh, let's take a break here and then come back and we'll talk about uh, the rest of this. Are you okay with that? Sounds good, Tim. Okay. Podcast, uh, we're going to take a commercial break. You stand by. We'll be right back. Now a word from our sponsors. Today's sponsor in part by Excel Roofing. Excel Roofing. They do it all. Roofs, siding, framing. You need a house? Give Excel a call. I've used these guys personally in the past. Have a professional crew. They're conscious of your job, and they want to produce the finest quality of craftsmanship available. Excel Roofing, 763-712-0757. Again, 763-712-0757. Excel Roofing, Dayton, Minnesota. Welcome back to podcast. If you heard that last segment and you get tears from your eyes, you're human. And I can only tell you that I welled up at a couple of those sections and wow. But Scott's going to give us some information more about the, the legal side of this, the, the, the part that is currently in motion. And, and without turning this into a conspiracy thing, I'd like to hear from him and say, okay, Scott, what do you really believe? Why do you think these guys took this kind of protocol before we jump really into the legal, but it ties that together with the legal? So why do you think that they illegally put a DNR on Grace? Well, that's a great question. I was asked this by a reporter right after the lawsuit dropped, and she asked me specifically, do you think Grace was killed because she has Down syndrome? I said, yes, I do. And she said, are you a conspiracy theorist? I said, well, people like you want to label me that way, but I have the proof. And... So she would, I said, are you at your laptop? She said, yes. I said, I want to send you an email. And let's go through something. And so first I educated her on the fact that 67% of Down syndrome people are murdered before they're born. Okay, so then you start with that. And then you see Obamacare was implemented on March 23rd of 2010. And Ezekiel Emanuel was the chief architect of Obamacare. And this is a quote from Ezekiel Emanuel. He said, quote, services provided to individuals who are irreversibly prevented from being or becoming participating citizens are not basic and should not be guaranteed. All right, so wrap your head around that statement. Then you look at how many people have actually read Obamacare. Well, Because of the research that I've been doing, Uh I discovered Section 1553 of Obamacare. And if you're not familiar with that section, Obamacare is 906 pages long. It's on page 141, and it calls out the, the method that they're, they want to use to kill people. And euthanasia, mercy killing, and assisted suicide are called out as tools right in Obamacare. Well, then I showed her the next document, which is... Uh, the document specifically for Down syndrome people. And how I got even clued into this, Tim, is God got me up one morning real early when I started researching in January. And the the thing that I did that morning was I went through all the records and looked for biases. And so they had biases related to the fact that we're Christian, biases related to the fact that Grace was unvaccinated, but the main bias that came through was Down syndrome. When a doctor enters a patient's room, they have to write a report. Okay. So at the end of their shift, they dictate a report. So there was 22 doctors who saw Grace during the seven days she was in the hospital. Those 22 doctors' reports referenced that Grace has Down syndrome 36 different times. Down syndrome does not change the standard of care. It should. And then, then I found the smoking gun document, which is from the Palliative Care Network of Wisconsin. And this document was written in July of 2011, one year after Obamacare was passed. And it's an implementation document. And it lays out specifically, it's a training document for MDs. And it lays out, like you would expect any training document, an introduction, a body, and conclusion. Well, the introduction says these Down syndrome people have nothing but problems, and they lay out about 50 problems. I have the document in front of me. So they lay out osteoporosis, chronic constipation, incontinence, uh, septal defects, thyroid dysfunction, blah, 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 blah. It just keeps, it doesn't say anything about the benefits. You know, you heard the benefits in section one of this this show. 
lays out all the problems. So then what's the purpose of that? They're trying to convince these medical professionals that the family doesn't want these Down syndrome children or adults in their life. So the transition statement says specifically, I'm quoting here, the lifelong toll on families is high. Part of a robust plan of care includes acknowledgement of this toll by healthcare workers, or excuse me, healthcare providers. So they're saying specifically, here's all the problems, and you gotta realize these families don't want these Down syndrome people in their life. And we, as healthcare providers, we have to acknowledge that fact. Okay, then they make the transition statement into uh, what is our responsibility with this fact pattern that we have sold you. This is, by the way, the spirit of collectivism. So collectivism says we've got to limit things or do things for the benefit of society, not the benefit of the individual. So that goes back to Ezekiel and Manuel's statement. So here's the, here's the closing statement in this training document. Whenever possible... Decision makers, that's the doctors, for people with Down syndrome should be encouraged to use substituted judgment to make key palliative care decisions. All efforts should be made to determine the preferences of the patient. However, because of lifelong cognitive impairment, the views of the person with Down syndrome may not be known. So the doctor is given the green light to make a decision on life or death with this person with Down syndrome. In the case of Grace, you know, putting an illegal DNR on her, I mean, that's it, it's unconscionable. And then the state organization who is supposed to pr protect the public, I wrote a complaint letter to them. It's the Department of Safety and Professional Services in Wisconsin. I wrote a complaint letter about the doctor putting this DNR order on Grace. And they wrote back on December 5th of 22 and said that the Wisconsin DNR statute does not apply to physicians operating in hospital, non-emergency room settings, such as the one in question. So they're saying the doctor can put a DNR in anybody he wants anytime if it's in a hospital setting. I gave you an awful long answer there. I, I, I hope that was acceptable. Sure, sure. I, I want a question about the page 141 of the Obamacare. When was that yes. published? March 23rd of 2010. 2010, okay. Because I find it odd that, you remember Jack Kevorkian? Yes. Now, he was he was actually sentenced in April of 99. Now, that's 10 years, 11 years after the fact. And, and if they're going to do, well, if it's, I mean, not that this is assisted suicide. This was actually some of the murder. But if Obamacare is going to employ these techniques in their law, why did they put this guy in jail at the time? I mean, it didn't make no yeah. sense to me. Well, that's a that's a fantastic question. This is by far and away the most important topic that I've been researching since Grace's death. I was not familiar at all with dialectics, <laughs> that they do one thing. It's like the magician. He does one thing with his left hand while the right hand is doing, all the, work, doing yeah. the other thing. So the Dvorkian... You can look at the Dvorkian situation as a psyop to set up what they really wanted to do. They take the the public has got their eye over here, and here they're doing this right now. The, sure. You know, of course, the largest psyop going on is the presidential election. They got everybody, and people don't realize that stuff doesn't matter. You know, it's all meant to take our eye off the ball while they do all this nefarious type of thing. So I would look at the Kevorkian situation as that was a tool to get them to be able to do this as a sleight of hands. It seems odd, doesn't it? 11 years later. Yes. But you know, Obamacare just didn't happen overnight. That was a, a writing of a writing of writing. And they had to get that passed through the state and the house and the Senate and everything. And, and it just all of a sudden, Hey, now we're doing Kevorkism. Now the doctors have that because everybody's under the scare of, of, of a pandemic, a, a plandemic. Well, I agree 100%. And, you know, people get hung up on Democrat, Republican. Yeah, I've been a conservative my whole life, but I'm, I, I, I am definitely not uh, involved with politics anymore. Zero percent. Uh, in fact, I want to run from it because <laughs> the Republicans had an opportunity to repeal this. They chose not to. 
So you don't don't look at this as you know they labeled it Obamacare, which is also you know what the technical name. I'd have to, I got to look this up if you want it. I can give you that. But the technical name they give you these these flowery names, so they don't ever tell you what they're what they're really doing. Um, I'm going to look this up quick, Tim, just so we have it. <laughs> well, it, you know, there, it's quite an interesting. Um, it, it's a way that they do this so that we we don't pay attention. Sure. I'm pulling up Obamacare right here, so we have the name. It's called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. So yes, and it's, it's on uh, March twenty third, twenty ten. It was signed by Obama. <laughs> and it's God. into law at that point. It's got yeah, I'm, I'm reading it too. But it just uh, again, it was just well, they put one guy in jail for helping people who who were terminal who had yes. a, a reasonable effort to, to not want to be here. And by their choice, they've made this. And he goes to jail. But yet these doctors run around making, I don't know, making their own law because of they're protected by this law and, and no one's willing to press on them. That, that just seems yeah. weird. So now now you got me mad, okay? <laughs> now, now I'm a little upset here. And I, and I want to I focus and I want to shift this thing into overdrive and say, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing legally to give these guys some some moment of pause? We took an extraordinary step. On April 11th, we filed a lawsuit. And I say it's extraordinary for two reasons. The first reason is this is the first lawsuit of its kind. And the reason it's the first lawsuit of its kind is because of tort reform. Tort reform was sold to us by the Republicans and... It's uh, tort reform. If you just process uh, the the largest tort reform that most people would be familiar with would be the uh, Vaccine Act of 1986 that President Reagan signed. Well, that gave immunity from liability to the vaccine manufacturers. So, what was the purpose of that? Well, they said, well, if vaccine manufacturers have downstream liability, they'll never produce vaccines. Well, first, that presumes that vaccines are even uh, necessary. Um, but then, you know, so they're really not necessary if you believe in God. But then if they are necessary, why don't they just manufacture something that works? Why do you need to have immunity from liability? Well, that same trickle-down effect is in all the state legis all the state statutes relative to suing doctors. There's limitations in all the state statutes. So when I talked with a medical malpractice attorney early on in Grace's case, this was way back, I met an attorney that was a partner in a 300 partner firm, so a huge firm. He said, Scott, you got a big case here. I'm gonna introduce you to the best medical malpractice attorney in Wisconsin. So he did, I talked with the man. He said, Scott, even in slam dunk cases like this appears to be, you only have a one in 10 chance of winning. So what's the reason? He said, let me tell you about a case. He said, I represented a family where the husband died. He had a son, a sponge sewed up inside of him with the, the surgery, and we lost. I said, how could you lose that case? He said, I brought in 10 experts, and they brought in 100. They circle the wagons around their own. And the financial piece of it, he explained the financial piece, which now I know because I read the state statute. The most you can win is $750,000. So do the math. The attorneys get a third, all right? So 750000 one in 10 chance is 75000 A third is 25000 Just the experts cost 100000 So unless you have the money right. to sue, no attorneys are taking on these cases, cases. So, you know, praise God that we had the money because we were going to take care of Grace after we died. So we're using the money to file a case that has an extremely low chance of winning, not because we don't have the facts on our side. I mean, we have the facts on our side, but we're going up against Ascension Hospital System. They're the second largest nonprofit in the United States. They're the largest Catholic hospital system. They have 30 billion in cash. They receive 10 billion in government bonus payments during the first year of COVID to do things like they did to Grace. I mean, this stuff is huge. So then, the se so all of that said, the second thing we did with this case that makes it extraordinary is we also filed against the five doctors and two nurses who were directly involved with Grace's death. Take it by personally. 
personally. Yep. And the reason we did that case is not about money. It's about shedding light on evil. And we want every single doctor and nurse in the entire country to know you cannot use the excuse of following protocols to kill people. That doesn't cut it. In God's economy, there is responsibility for choice. And you made a choice, and now you have a consequence. Uh, so we filed the case uh, April 11th. They, all the defendants had to respond by May 15th. They did. Uh, I'll just share, a, uh, I think I have it here. Yeah, just a couple of funny responses to give you a perspective. Uh, so Ascension Health is one of the ones that had to respond. And they, they wrote, in answer to paragraph six of the complaint, deny that Ascension Health directly provides health care services. <laughs> you know, just process that. You know, that's you know, they obviously want us to spend more money on legal fees to say, well, you do provide health care services. But this is the the most interesting one. Affirmative defense number six. They they wrote, quote, any and all injuries or damages sustained by plaintiffs may be a direct and proximate result of the negligence and or decisions made by the plaintiffs. So they're blaming me for Grace's death, which I've of course already admit. The, I took her to the hospital because of fear, so I am guilty of that. But I did not cause her death. You know, so it's, this is the crazy stuff. Well, we have a hearing coming up now on July 14th, and yeah, that's a big deal. And that's next this next Friday. Uh, it's a, a hearing on a partial motion to dismiss. And what they did is they're trying to frame Grace's case as only a medical malpractice case. And medical malpractice is is uh, a result of what the case is really about. Sure. The case is about lack of informed consent, which is a legal battery. If we would have had informed consent, Grace would be here today. Right. But they just do everything without your knowledge. And then the person ends up dead and they want to put it into this medical malpractice classification because of the limits of liability, which is how we got started with this conversation. And I'll just quote one thing out of the brief that they wrote. And this this shares with you, they're not bashful about this. They, they wrote, quote, the legislature's purpose in an enacting a statutory scheme to govern claims for damages arising out of the alleged medical negligence was to encourage health care providers to remain in Wisconsin by imposing certain limits on the causes of action that a patient or family member can pursue and on the types and amount of the damages that can be recovered. So when you look at that, it's the same as the, the vaccine injury exclusion from 1986. Sure. Is that, if, why don't you just produce a good product? Why don't you just be a good doctor? If you're a good doctor, you're not going to kill somebody. Then you don't need to have statutory liability protection. Okay. Um, all this has been running through my head. And we're uh, 17 minutes in this last segment. What do you think Grace would say about this lawsuit with them? I mean, it's kind of an open question, but it, she seems very insightful and very, you know, I got to know her a little bit here today. What would you say? <laughs> I know exactly what she would say because Jessica, the first time, the very first time I got on the air was on Newsmax, on December thirteenth of two thousand twenty-one, mm -hmm. and Jessica called me after I was on live TV and said, "Dad, Grace is up there saying way to go, Earthly Dad." Earthly Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a heck of a say, right? <laughs> we're all in on this tim you know the lawsuit i'm not putting any faith in the lawsuit because it's a it's a judicial system that's also corrupt but we're using the lawsuit as a tool to to, sh to shine light on evil so the public knows what's going on grace's case is one of 1.2 million that happened during the 39 month covid era the pandemic yes okay what an interview. Uh, where can be people help donate? Let's do that before we go. Um, they can. We have a gifts and go set up for Grace. The easiest way to get there, because I don't have the address memorized, but we set up a, a landing page for people to sign up to follow the case, and then there's a donate button there that connects to the gifts and go, and that is gracesherra.com, and Shara is S-C-H-A-R-A. 
So that's the easiest way for people to help. We're really trying to get a database of people because there are going to be multiple calls to action as things progress. And, you know, of course, we appreciate donations also. Okay. Find them on the web. Google them. You you can find them. Uh, it just help them out. See what we can do. And you guys in other countries, I don't expect uh, too much out of that era because, you know, you guys got to do the translation and money to all that. But uh, if you can do, and this isn't just a, a U.S. problem. This is a, a foreign problem. This is a global problem. And hopefully you guys ain't running into the same problem we are. Anything to add before we go, Scott? It's just a gift to be on your program, Tim. I appreciate it very much. The single most important thing I would tell anybody listening is if your goal is to be prepared for a hospital stay, you have to change your belief. We believe that a hospital is a safe zone. And if you have that belief, the same thing can happen to you. If you believe what I just told you about grace and that hospitals are not safe zones, you'll do what's necessary to be protected. Be your own advocate. Yep, there's a whole bunch of things in that line, but that's going to be another program. Yeah. Okay, super duper. Then we're going to pull the pin. This is going to be a long show the way it is. Thanks for listening, everybody. I appreciate it. Scott, thanks for coming on today, and and I'm very sorry for your whole situation. Thanks for having me, Tim. Okay, Hutcast. Thanks for all listening, and uh, I just got to go process this and And we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Hutcast is out. And that's a wrap for Hutcast. Hutcast is, again, a pragmatic approach to seeing things how some people see them. If you like our show, give us a thumbs up on the Facebook site. Again, for Hutcast, thank you again. Have a wonderful evening.